Hello everyone, this is the Butts Church in Alton, Hampshire, on Sunday the 9th of May 2021 at 6.30pm uh, in the evening. It is good to be able to uh, welcome you to this act of worship together. We're going to begin by the singing of a great hymn uh, written by Vernon Hyam, the Welsh minister uh, of blessed memory, and we thank God for him and his ministry but also for this very remarkable hymn, Great is the Gospel of our Glorious God. So shall we sing together. Great is the gospel of our glorious God, where mercy met the anger of God's rod. A penalty was paid and pardon bought, and sinners lost at last to has died that I may call him mine that I may sing with those who dwell above adoring praise in Jesus King of love great is the mystery is the work of God's own holiness. It moves my soul and causes me to long for greater joys than to the earth belong. Oh, let the praises of my Christ has died that I may call him mine, that I may sing with those who dwell above, adoring praising Jesus, King of love. The Spirit vindicated Christ our Lord, and angels sang with joy and sweet accord. The nations heard a dark world flamed with light when Jesus rose in glory. has died that I may call him mine that I may sing with those who dwell above adoring praising Jesus King of love Let us pray. Our God and our Father, how we thank you for the glorious gospel, the wonderful truth, the good news, as gospel means, the good news of salvation in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do indeed bless you that we can come and rejoice on this day, Sunday, the first day of the week, 
the day on which you created light and on which our light, the Lord Jesus Christ, rose again from the dead, triumphant over death, having paid the price of your wrath against the sin of your people and also given us hope and a future. We just bless you for all these wonderful things and we thank you that across our land, indeed across the world today, there will be many people worshipping the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we come today together, we just ask that you would bless our time and help us to understand uh, these great truths in even greater clarity and bring to our mind as we go on through another week by your grace the things about our faith. We also thank you Lord Jesus that you gave us a prayer that we can say together and please say it with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And now we have a, a reading from God's word. 1 John chapter 2 verses 12 to 14. I'm writing to you dear children because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you dear children because you know the father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So we come again to prayer, and uh, you may not see it very clearly, but on my tie there are images from India, and of course, with so many places in need, we remember that great country particularly today. So let us pray together. Our Lord and our God, we do indeed come before you this day to thank you for all the good things that we enjoy. We pray especially for the country of India today, which is suffering so appallingly from the effects of the COVID virus. There are many reasons for that, undoubtedly, but it doesn't stop us from praying for them. And for those of us who have been privileged to fly over uh, the breadth of the country, we know how enormous it is and how many people live there. But nonetheless, we thank you that you are a God who creates us, but also a God who loves people. And so you've made this glorious gospel known to us that we've sung about already. And we pray for your people today in India, that you will be with them, that you would encourage them and that you would bless them. We think also of other areas in the world in great need and we just ask that you would help and that you would sustain. And as we come this weekend, and no doubt as this is recorded earlier than we are watching it, um, there are many items and things that have been taking place that have disturbed our minds or caused us concern. We think especially of those involved in shipping, seeing the dispute that has taken place with France over Jersey. And we also <coughs> bring to you all the merchant sailors of the world that they uh, are involved in bringing such uh, goods to us and such need to us and so we just uh, pray for them that in their um, work that you would help them. We thank you for those who have missions especially to those involved in the sailing industry and we ask that you would bless them as they come to these people. We also think of those involved as lorry drivers transporting goods not only around the nation, but around 
uh, as they cross over into the continent, that you would indeed help them as well. And we think of those involved with the air travel and especially air freight. We really are a global people and we thank you for all those who bring us things that we enjoy and we are so thankful for. But we also remember our nations as we have been involved in elections. We just pray that those who have been elected to positions of responsibility will realise that it is you who bring everyone into that place. And so we just pray that uh, there will be many who love you, who have been elected to offices of power and responsibility, and that you would use them to bless and to encourage. We also, as a church fellowship, remember Richard and Wendy before you. We thank you for the life of Wendy and uh, the time that Richard and Wendy were with us, but we just especially pray that you'll be with Richard and the family as they have to make arrangements and also as a service will take place that it will truly glorify you as we know that uh, Wendy uh, glorified you. So we thank you that we have so many things that we can bring to you this day and we just ask that you would indeed help us to remember that you are the God who forgives us our sin. That is why the gospel is so glorious the God who places yourself, God the Holy Spirit within us, to guide us, to encourage us, to change us and to lead us. So we pray that as we go on into this new week together, that we would know your presence and enabling with us. So we thank you for all these good things, especially we ask that you would forgive us all our sin and that you would indeed be pleased to put your power within and all these things we ask in your precious name. Amen. We now come to sing our next hymn, which is King of Kings, which reminds us how glorious the Lord Jesus is. Let us sing together.
Well, we're continuing our look at John's Gospel and uh, the reading we had earlier from uh, 1 John chapter 2. It's just a few verses, verses 12 to 14. And uh, I want to share them with you. And it's uh, under the title of Good News for All because uh, we often say that uh, we live in an age when we don't have as enough good news. Well, we have good news for all here when God gives us uh, that which we need to know. Now, as we're going through 1 John, um, we find that John is developing his theme of true Christianity. So we've seen some big things. We've seen uh, a right view of Jesus, and uh, we've been challenged about sin and how awful it is, and also about obedience. Are we an obedient people, obedient unto God, which I trust we are. And he's moved into illustrating these things with light and darkness, and if you were with us last week, you would have seen uh, Ben um, lighting up and darkening uh, the room he was in uh, to such good effect. Now, John becomes more personal. He looks at the group that he's writing to and uh, he encourages us to consider who they were. Like the wise and good pastor that he is, he focuses on the practical outworking of these things. It is one thing to have head knowledge, but quite another to have an experiential outworking of true religion in our lives. And uh, as James says in James 2 verse 19, you believe there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So we remember that uh, people can believe without it being um, confession and without it being life-changing for the glory of God. So we, we, we take on board what these things tell us. So mere intellectual assent uh, to the truth regarding God does not and will not save. The sort of faith, for instance, that a demon professes begets nothing but trembling at the certainty of the reality of God. Consequently, it is barren. Alec Matea wrote those words. Sham religion is to be avoided at all costs, and that is the love that God uh, hates, that it's sham religion. And so we come and we look at these verses together, and today I just have one heading for all three of the verses, and we will try and work through um, what we're being told here. So we are told that the forgiveness of God is seen in the true family of God. So the forgiveness of God seen in the true family of God means that it's, it's commonplace in that respect to all of us, that we are blessed to enjoy together the benefits and the fruits of what Christ achieved for us in the glorious gospel. Now, like Paul in uh, Titus chapter 2, John, for greater effect, refers to greater, uh, sorry, to different people groups. Um, both Paul and John do this to show that the gospel is for every age and it's one that uh, we should appreciate and understand. They do this not to minimise but maximise their words. So sometimes you have to address certain groups or certain peoples um, to get the effect you want. And so this is what they do. Hopefully people won't say, oh, what he's writing about is just for them and not for us because it uh, applies to all of us. Um, but those things, while applied to certain age groups, are for everyone to hear and take on board. So what we have here is not a terminus. I have achieved these things, therefore I don't need to know anything else. Um, I have arrived at a certain position and therefore can take it easy. But it's a call to progress in the Christian life. Now in verses 12 and 13, it might appear uh, that he's uh, not being very kind, really, talking especially about young children and uh, those who are fathers and young men. Um, it's, it's as though he, he was just picking on these people. Well, he's not, but uh, um, he's referring to them, knowing that they have an influence in life and it affects young ladies as well. He refers to young people, little children, or those who are children in the faith, beginners in the Christian faith, who don't know uh, quite as much as others do. 
uh, but hopefully will go on to maturity. And uh, he is being a spiritual father, and then he will address fathers as well. He tells those young in the faith, or those young people who are Christians, that in Christ Jesus, sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Isn't that interesting? For his name's sake. That's what we have there, that uh, we are told, on account of his name in, in the end of verse 12. Uh, his name is, of course, Jesus, which is Yeshua in uh, Hebrew, but uh, also the uh, version there in uh, uh, of Joshua, and it means saviour, and that's what Joshua was. You looked in the Old Testament, if you look at that man's account, you'll see what a saviour he was, but also you'll see how it applies very much to the Lord Jesus being the ultimate saviour. And so he's come to them and he tells them that that in Christ Jesus your sins are forgiven. The ultimate saviour, he will forgive your sins if you come to him. And how fundamental and essential this is to comprehend. Have we comprehended it? Do we understand it? And of course, whatever age we are, whatever group we might consider we're in, um, we can never be in the family of God unless our sins have been forgiven. As it says in verse 13, I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. There are certain responsibilities in the Bible, especially the New Testament, to those who are fathers, physical fathers, heads of the family, or those who act as heads of the family. You are to lead your family aright. There are many other distractions, but do you lead them aright to God and under God? He reminds that they have known the Saviour from the beginning, meaning that from the first time they put their trust in him, they were known God, and we often pray that, don't we, our Father in heaven. And uh, that is what they have come to understand, and they've got to realise that they have to live out what God has said and to show God in the lives of families. And so we come along and we think, well, what is he really talking about here? Well, he's writing so that they know these things are true. And we should know these things are true as well. Also in verse 14, I am writing to you, young men. And uh, sorry, verse 13, I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And then uh, he goes on to say in verse 14, I write to you, dear children. And so he, he sums it all up, doesn't he? In verse 14, I write to you, dear children. I write to you, fathers. I write to you, young men. And uh, he says to your children as well, they can know God um, because you know the Father. How amazing that is, that God enables whatever age we are to come and to know God as Father if we put our trust in him. But also I write to you, fathers, because you know him from the beginning. See, we have that again. And I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So we have all these things are presented to us here. Um, the eternity of God the Father is also referred to from the beginning. He's always been, always will be. And fathers must remember there is a, a greater onus on them to teach these things to their family or to enable their families to come to church uh, so that they learn these things from others as well. So we don't need to go into this in very great detail because it seems obvious. But is it obvious? Is it so obvious that we decide to do other things with our time and not to show God's love and not to teach God's love? Now, young men, of course, have referred to here, young people, those in the prime of life. Uh, some of us can just about remember what it was like with energy and ambition coursing through the veins. Those who consider themselves to be indomitable and indestructible. Have you ever felt like that? And as though uh, bad things happen to other people and not to you. Well, you need to understand that you have come to Christ if you are like that, who have 
the word of God, verse uh, 14, right at the end, the word of God living in you, because that enables you to overcome the evil one. It's interesting in the version that we use, which we think is closer to the original, not that we would argue with others who use other versions, uh, but deliver us from the evil one. That is what we want. We want delivery from him, and it's the evil one here. So do not try to live by and through your own energy and resources. We need God to be with us. And always look to Jesus, whatever age we are, um, as you are, verse 14, young people strong and the word of God lives in you richly. Don't take it for granted. It will always be like that. Look to Jesus because life does change and our circumstances do. That is what makes them strong and enables them to overcome Satan, the evil one. And that is what we all want. So in emphasis, these things to these different groups, John is trying to get his message across in a way that will not be forgotten. It is so easy to become complacent to think that we know it all. And it's so sad when you hear people saying, well, I don't need to read my Bible anymore. I don't need to come to church anymore because I know it all. Oh, really? I wonder how much any of us really, truly know. It's easy to become complacent to think that we are in control of our lives when we're not and to allow lethargy to creep in and a shallow attitude of heart, mind and soul develop towards spiritual things. So John writes as an older man with great wisdom and with great urgency. He's trying to awaken us to the perils around us. The great need of the hour is not for Christians to blithely give lip service to the things of God, but we need to be active in prayer, in Bible study, in evangelism, as he says in these verses. So are we alive to Pastor John's message? Are we all moving on in the things of God? Do we avoid being in the same place we were in the past? We need to think through our faith. There's a story told of a little boy who had been tucked up in bed and the light extinguished for the night. A short time later, he fell out of bed. Mum, as they are wont to do, came rushing up the stairs to see what the commotion was about. What happened, she said. I don't know, replied the boy, but I must have gone to sleep too near to where I got in. Are we progressing in the Christian life? Or are we still close to where we got in? And so we are in danger of slipping out, as it were, injuring ourselves, potentially. Not regarding salvation, but our security and comfort in God. Is it possible that we haven't moved on, moved into a better place with the Lord? For if we do not progress and remain as infants in the faith, as Paul lamented in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 2, Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, but you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. Are you still too close to the edge uh, to where you came in, as it were, as Christians? I trust God will keep us all from remaining immature. Now, the Bible is in two parts, Old and New Testament. And uh, the Old Testament is a brilliant, well, it tells us why we're in such a state uh, there in the book of Genesis. But as the story unfolds, the story of salvation, it tells us why we need God. But also we find that uh, we get many case examples of people who may have lived a long time ago but did the things that we do and experience the things that we do as well. Now, in the second book of Kings, 2 Kings chapter 1, we have these words. After Ahab's death, Moab rebelled against Israel. Now, Ahaziah had fallen through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria 
and injured himself. Now, this is a very interesting um, statement that is made. Um, it may not be true of you, but I'm full of questions. What was he doing uh, so close to the lattice? Um, had someone been naughty and weakened it in some way that when he leant on it, it gave way? Um, he came to injure himself. How did that happen? Did he fall in such a way that he couldn't uh, move without others' help? Well, we are told, as it goes on uh, in, in 2 Kings chapter 1, he sent messengers saying to them, Go and consult Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, to see if I will recover from this injury. It's amazing how many people think of God as the god of convenience, um, or as someone different to any other god, or not different to any god, uh, no difference at all to any other god. And it's as though this, this man um, had it in his mind that if I'm in real need, who do I go to? Well, Beelzebub. So we have many questions here about why he thought that way. Well, we do know because 2 Kings 1 starts with after Ahab's death. And Ahab had opened up the land of Israel um, to false religion. The sewage of false religion came in and polluted in a big way the minds, the hearts and the lives of the people that were there. And so we find this here very much that um, this man made a very wrong decision. Don't know, but see why he did it. Um, because he was someone who should have known better. Now we are told if you look through the Old Testament, the law of the Old Testament, that God, even though um, people didn't want to uh, follow him, would cry out for a king. And he said, well, when that happens, the king has a responsibility not only to read all through the law, but to lead the people aright. The king was like the father of the nation. And he was to lead in ways which would glorify God. Well, these people had, uh, had le left that all behind because the king set a wrong example. He was to be a true leader in righteousness and godliness. But instead, he looked elsewhere. I think other things are better than you, Lord. I think other gods can do what you can't do. So he sent messengers to Beelzebub, god of Ekron. Now, Ekron was a Philistine city. So it was in what we would consider a pagan place. Why would the king in Israel go somewhere else? Well, because he had fallen far from uh, true religion. So as we've seen in this passage, just to come back, and there are many other examples in the Old Testament, I encourage you to read it, of things that uh, didn't happen as it should have done because people were led astray. Fathers, are you leading your family aright? Only you will know. Children, young men, do you follow the Lord? Well, only you will know. Or is it just words? When trouble comes, to whom do you turn? Well, we see here that Ahaziah turned the wrong way. And that is always, always such difficulty. We are given clear guidance in the scriptures as to why we should follow the Lord, why we should always um, be looking to him. But like uh, this Old Testament king, what are the motives of our lives? Where, where does it come from? Why do we feel like that? What are our cravings? What do we look to? What are we after? So to understand the things of God, we need to read his word. We need to follow in his ways. And we are to ask him to guide us. Because understanding the things of God puts everything else in its true place. Remember, as the scripture says, this world won't last forever. Um, we're going to look some time later with Ben as we go on through this passage. And we will get to verse 17. 
The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So are we prepared to take these things seriously? Are we prepared to put them in place? So God loves people, but he loves them above all to follow him. Life is passing. The world of Satan and his demons, who prefer to drag us down, will be gone eventually. We need to consider the things, the eternal things of God's reality. He alone satisfies. May we look to him, what he wants for our lives. For whoever does the will of God is the person who trusts in him, believes in him, and follows him as we want to do so here. That is why Christ died, so that his precious blood would not only bear the wrath of God against our sin, but would open to us an eternal world of joy and peace and satisfaction. How glorious this is. I trust the Lord will have mercy on us, whoever we are, children, young people, fathers, all of us, that we may all be obedient, that we will live in the light of God, both now and forevermore. And may he truly bless us. We're now going to come and sing our last hymn, which is another great hymn, There is a Hope. So it means that these things are not just mere words, but there is a hope that they will be fulfilled if we put our trust in him. There is a hope that burns within my heart That gives me strength for every passing day A glimpse of glory now revealed in eager part Yet drives all doubt away I stand in Christ with sins forgiven and Christ in me, the hope of them, my highest calling and my deepest joy to make his will my own. There is a hope that lifts my weary head, a consolation strong against despair. That when the world has plunged me in its deepest pit, I find the Saviour there. Through present sufferings, future's fear, He whispers courage in my ear, for I am safe in everlasting arms. And they will lead me home There is a hope that stands the test of time That lifts my eyes beyond the beckoning grave To see the matchless beauty of a day divine When I behold his face Suffering cease and sorrows die, and every longing satisfied, then joy unspeakable will flood my soul, for I am truly So let us conclude by praying together. Lord, we do indeed thank you that there is a hope, a hope that is 
of you and from you and to you, and we bless you for it. We just ask that you would help us to understand and to believe in these things and to trust in them. And that as we go on, we will know your presence with us. Bless our friends and our families, wherever they are, that they too may know your goodness and your grace. So may the peace of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen. Well, thank you for joining with us for this act of worship. And we pray that until we meet again, God will be very close to you.